The demons then assumed corporal shapes of the most horrible and dreadful kind, and they began to emit fearful howls, roaring with terrible voices, pretending to rush upon her and threatening destruction. They shook the earth and the house, striving also by other furious assaults to frighten and disturb the princess of the world, so that at least in this, or in making her desist from prayer, they might seem victorious. But the invincible and magnanimous heart of Most Holy Mary was not disturbed, nor moved in the least. It must be remembered that in order to enter upon this battle, the Lord left her entirely to the resources of her own faith and virtue. He suspended the effects of the other favours and privileges which she was wont to enjoy at other times. The Most High wished it so, in order that the triumph of his mother might be more glorious and honourable. Besides this, there were the other reasons which God has in allowing the souls to be tempted in this manner. His judgments are unsearchable and unknowable. At times the great lady would repeat, Who is like unto God, that lives in the highest, and looks upon the humble in heaven and on earth? By these words she routed the hosts that opposed her. Then these hungry wolves laid aside their terrible shapes. They assumed sheep's clothing, transforming themselves into angels of light, resplendent and beautiful. Approaching the heavenly lady, they said, Thou hast conquered, thou hast conquered. We come to attend on thee, and reward thy fortitude and invincible courage. Surrounding her, they protested their friendship in flattering and deceitful terms. But the most prudent lady withdrew within herself, suspended all the activity of her senses, and, raising herself above herself by means of the infused virtues, adored the Lord in spirit and in truth. Despising all the snares of these evil tongues and their deceitful lies, she spoke to her most holy son, My Lord and Master, light of light and my strength, in thy help alone do I place all my confidence and the exaltation of thy holy name. All those that speak otherwise I abjure, abhor, and detest. But the doers of evil persevered in their insane attempts against the mother of knowledge, and continued to extol beyond the skies her who had humiliated herself beneath the lowest of creatures. They protested that they wished to exalt her above all women, and confer upon her an exquisite favour. They would select her in the name of the Lord, for the mother of the Messiah, and they assured her that her holiness would be greater than that of the patriarchs and prophets. Lucifer himself was the author of this new plot, and his malice is here made known for a warning to other souls. But it was ridiculous to offer to Mary, the Queen of Heaven, a dignity already her own. They themselves were ensnared and deceived, not only in offering what they neither knew nor were able to give, but also in being ignorant of the sacrament of the King, so intimately connected with the most blessed woman whom they persecuted. Nevertheless, the iniquity of the dragon was great, because he knew that he could not fulfil what he promised. He tried to spy out whether perhaps our blessed lady held that dignity, or whether she would give him some sign by which he could conjecture it. Most Holy Mary was aware of this double dealing of Lucifer, and admirably met it with a quiet firmness. She answered the deceitful flatteries by quietly continuing her prayer and adoring the Lord. Prostrated upon the floor, she humiliated herself, confessing herself as the most despicable of creatures, more despicable than the dust under her feet. By this humble prayer and prostration, she cut off the presumptuous pride of Lucifer as long as this temptation lasted. As for the rest which happened, the cunning of the demons, their cruelty and lying deceits on this occasion, it seemed to me that I should not relate all, nor that I should expatiate on all that has been shown to me. Let this much suffice for our instruction, for not all can be trusted to the ignorance of weak and earthly creatures. Dismayed and routed, the first host of enemies retired and gave way to the second. 
these were to tempt her, who was the most poor of humankind, to the sin of avarice. They offered to her great riches, gold, silver, and most precious gems, and in order that these might not seem empty promises, they placed before her a great quantity of these riches, although they were only apparent, for they thought that they could exert greater influence on her will by actually presenting these objects before her. They accompanied this offer with many deceitful words, and told her that God had sent her all this for distribution among the poor. When they saw that all this had no effect upon her, they changed their tactics and urged that since she was so holy, it was a great wrong that she should remain so poor. It was more reasonable that she possess these riches than that they remain in the hands of wicked sinners, for this would be an injustice and a disarrangement of the divine providence that the just be visited with poverty, while God's wicked enemies abound in riches and affluence. In vain the net is spread before the eyes of the bird in its flight, says the wise man. This was true of all the temptations of our sovereign queen. But the malice of the serpent was much more preposterous in regard to this temptation of avarice, for this phoenix of poverty was so far removed from the earth, and winged her flight so far above that of even the seraphim, that such a vile and contemptible snare was entirely in vain. The most prudent lady, although she possessed divine wisdom, never undertook to argue with these enemies, as in truth nobody should, for they battle against the manifest truth and will not admit defeat, even when they must acknowledge its effects. The most holy Mary made use of some words of the holy scriptures and repeated them with serene humility. On this occasion she selected the words of the 118th Psalm. I have acquired for my heritage and for my riches the keeping of thy testimonies and thy laws, my Lord. She made use of many other passages, gratefully praising and blessing the Most High, because he had created and preserved her without her merits. In this most wise manner she rejected and overcame the second temptation to the confusion and torment of these agents of iniquity. Then advanced the third legion, led on by the prince of impurity who assails the weakness of the flesh. These made so much the greater efforts because they foresaw more clearly the improbability of success, and in truth they gained less than all the others, if one may speak of more or less in these different temptations of the Virgin Mary. They tried to suggest to her vile images, and to produce before her eyes unspeakable monstrosities. But all their efforts vanished in mid-air, for the most pure virgin, as soon as she had recognized the first signs of this vice, withdrew entirely within herself, and suspended all the activity of her senses. Thus not even the shadow of a suggestion or indecent image could enter her thoughts, since none of her faculties were in action. With a most ardent longing, she renewed many times her vow of chastity in the presence of the Lord, and she merited more on this occasion than all the virgins that ever existed or will exist in this world. The Almighty furnished her with such virtue that in comparison the sudden expulsion of the cannonball from the cannon is but a poor image of the force with which these enemies were repelled from the presence of Most Holy Mary when they sought to touch her purity by their temptations. The fourth legion undertook to test her meekness and patience, seeking to move this mildest dove to anger. This temptation was most annoying, for the demons overturned the whole house. They broke and shattered everything contained therein, and in such a manner as to cause the greatest amount of, anno amount of annoyance to the most meek lady but her holy angels soon repaired all the damage. Foiled in this attempt, the demons assumed the shapes of some women known to the serenest princess. They flew at her with greater wrath and fury than if they had been real women. They added outrageous insults, dared to threaten her, and took possession of things most necessary. 
but all these were only despicable tricks in the eyes of her that knew them, for none of their pranks and assaults escaped the penetration of the Most Holy Mary. She disregarded them altogether, and despised them entirely, without giving any signs of being moved or influenced by them. The demons then chose a real woman of a disposition adapted to their purposes, whom they influenced by diabolical art against the Princess of Heaven. For this purpose one of the demons assumed the shape of an acquaintance of this woman, and began to tell her that this Mary, the wife of Joseph, had slandered her in her presence, and had accused her of many gross faults, which this demon invented for the occasion. The deceived woman, who was naturally very much inclined to anger, hastened furiously to our meekest lamb, and hurled at her the vilest accusations and insults. She, however, allowing the angry woman to pour out her wrath, gradually began to speak to her in words so humble and sweet that she changed her entirely, appeased and softened her heart. When she had thus brought her about, she consoled and admonished her against the wiles of the devil. As this woman was poor, Mary added some arms and dismissed her in peace. Thus also this attempt was foiled, just as were many others, by which Lucifer tried to irritate our meekest dove and bring her into discredit. The Most High always defended the honour of His Most Holy Mother, making use of her own perfection in virtue, and of her prudence and humility, so that the devil could never succeed in harming her good name in the least. She always acted so prudently, and with so much meekness and wisdom, that the multitude of the hellish attempts were totally ineffectual. The tranquillity and meekness of the Sovereign Lady during these temptations of the dragon caused the admiration of the angels. Even the demons were full of astonishment, though of a different kind, at seeing such behaviour in a mere creature and that a woman, for never had they seen the like. The fifth legion followed with temptations to gluttony. Although the ancient serpent did not bid our queen to turn stones into bread, as he afterwards presumed to do with her most holy son, for he had not seen her do such great wonders, since they had been withheld from his knowledge. Yet he tempted her like the first woman with the pleasures of the taste. They placed before her a great feast, in order to incite and mislead her appetite by outward allurance. They tried to influence the humours of her body, so as to cause in her a counterfeit hunger, and they used other means to attract her attention to what they were offering. But all their labour was in vain and without effect, for from all these material and earthly things the noble heart of our princess was as far removed as heaven is from earth. Just as little did she use her senses in order to enjoy the pleasures of taste, yea, she never even took notice of them, for in all things she had set herself to counteract what our first mother Eve had done. Eve incautiously and heedlessly had looked upon the beauty of the tree of knowledge and upon its sweet fruit, and then had reached out her hand to eat, thus beginning our woe. Not so, most holy Mary, who withdrew and locked up her senses, although she was in no such danger as Eve. Our first mother was overcome for our perdition, while our queen conquered for our rescue and salvation.' 